Welcome. This is Power Trading Radio. Live. Power Trading Radio. Live. Fueled by Online Trading Academy. For more information on the show, visit us online at powertradingradio.com. Now, here's your host, Merlin Rothfeld. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Power Trading Radio. It is your Monday edition, a slightly different show today. Today, we're going to have Rick Wright on the program talking global currencies. I know normally Mondays is a stock day and Forex is on Tuesday. Sorry to throw everybody off schedule, but it's been a couple weeks since we actually had a currency show. So I said, let's bump it up, get on there as soon as possible. Rick will be here in studio with me in just a little bit. So if you have a currency Forex question, let us know what they are. Send them on in at powertradingradio.com by clicking that button that says Power Blast or you can go to our YouTube channels. We're broadcasting under Online Trading Academy as well as Power Trading Radio's YouTube channels. We're watching those right now. And of course, uh, usually have our, community, our active community out there. So hello, Gizmo and Ruben, who's uh, usually on there, and others that are waiting and lurking in the shadows. You always lurk in the shadows. Say hello, join the conversation, ask some questions along the way, because we know if you're tuning in, you probably want to learn something. So let us know what it is you'd like us to cover today, and we will uh, hopefully get that answer for you. All right, uh, a couple pieces of house cleaning to do. We are doing a webinar tomorrow. Or not, wait, sorry, strike that from the record, Your Honor. On Thursday. Uh, Thursday, what day is that, TJ? That's going to be December 12th. We're going to do a webinar. It is called 2020 Vision, the top four events that could impact investments in 2020. To see that and to register, you simply go to otacademy.com. It's right on the front page. You see a button there that says webinar. You click on that one. And that brings you up to a little bit more descriptive piece. Look, there are hundreds and hundreds of things which are going to have a significant impact on our markets in 2020. What we try to do is really outline some of the big ones and offer some insights as to what that might do as far as market direction going forward. So uh, I would encourage you to join that one. It will be fully interactive. We'll have the chat going as well. So you guys can say, Merlin, you're crazy. Or you can actually say, hey, I think you're right on that one. Or even add some color commentary yourself to our discussion. But again, join us. That will be this Thursday, December 12th at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Should go for about, well, we'll say 35 to 45 minutes. And again, we'd love to have you guys join us on that one. All right. Let's go from there. Simon is going to bring up our Bitcoin price chart, which makes it the worst performer on the day by a good margin. You know, it's it's kind of disappointing to see this one keep dropping. Of course, it's not falling as fast as I thought it would. I thought we'd be down to the 6,000 mark. It's some of the other altcoins really getting crushed. Uh, today, Bitcoin is down 2.75%. That's in the last 24 hours. Finishing out the day down $207 to 7,347 on the day, making it, as I mentioned, by a long shot your worst performer on the day. Over to Click we go to check out our number six performer, which is going to be the 10-year Treasury note. You'll see on this chart here that it's been uh, about four days in a row of downside movement here on that 10-year. That means that yields have been rising. Today, you saw a little bit of a green candle as we saw an uptick in, uh, in the price of the bonds, which means the yield was dropping. We're back down to 1.829. That's a slide of 0.7% for the 10-year note out there. Nothing really that noteworthy with it as far as you look at the price chart here. Uh, it, it does look like overall that this is just going to slowly be drifting down with regards to the price, which would mean that the yields are, uh, if, if the price of the bonds are drifting down, that means that the yields are going up. So we'll, uh, we'll keep an eye on that situation. I actually thought we would see that 10-year start to drop even further. Uh, with regards to yields, meaning that we would see this note hit all time, or not all time, but highs that go back into September. That did not happen. I have been wrong on that one to be sure. All right, that was number six, down 0.71% for the 10 year. Crude oil is our next victim. Half of a percent, pretty much everything today, guys, it was, it was glum out there. It wasn't the best uh, market day for anybody who was bullish. If you look at the price chart here for crude oil, we were down 0.49%. That finished the day at $58.91 per barrel. All in all, I look at the candle for today, I'm not disappointed with it. I actually think that's a pretty positive sign. Uh, we, we've seen candles like this before, which lead to more upside movement. And the trend is your friend right now. We are coming in to overhead supply, but it's been, it's been beaten up. Um, I think what will happen here probably over the next couple weeks is you'll see a big break, and we'll see this thing back up around 63 in a period of a couple weeks. So all in all, crude oil, even though it was down 0.49% today, still looking technically rather strong. All right, that's not the podium, though. We'll have to wait one more. This is number four. This is the chart of the NASDAQ. 100 futures, as you can see on our screen and our watermark on click. The NASDAQ composite was down 0.4%. Uh, let's, uh, yeah, let, let's go, um, I'm going to take some of these settings off. Sometimes these little, these uh, numbers kind of block the screen. Thanks, Simon. Take off that high and low. There we go. That looks a little bit better. All right. So you see the, the price action today on the NASDAQ 100 on your screen. The composite was down 0.4%. That dropped it to 86.21. 
on the day, really just giving back some of the gains we had in the previous sessions. You can see that big green candle and all of a sudden a little, uh, little red one here to, to take it a little bit of it back, but still on all looking pretty darn strong out there for the NASDAQ. All right, podium time it is. We move over to the S&P 500, which even though it was in third place, was still negative by one third of 1%. Same picture we saw with the NASDAQ, right? We had that big green candle in our previous session. Today you have that nice red one. Taking about half of those gains away, uh, 0.32 is the slide, 3,135 is where we closed at. Now we are down uh, another two points in the after hour session here, so you no, know, it's not like it's falling fast or anything, but just wanted to update that uh, because these numbers I took were taken from the market close. So all in all, you're looking at 0.32% down. Right now it's closer to 04 but yeah, who's keeping track of that stuff? All right, that was your bronze medal winner. Russell 2000 comes in with the silver place medal or silver metal. Uh, notice the difference in the appearance on this chart here, right? The green candle, great, nice strong move to the upside. Today's little green, a little red candle, taking away about a third of the previous session's gains. In the other indexes we looked at, which is the S&P and the NASDAQ, it took away half of it. So obviously showing some resilience here with the Russell 2000, a little bit of internal strength. It was up point, or sorry, down 0.26%, 1,629 is where it finished at. As I mentioned, that made it your number two. Now, not everything has to be glum out there. We can go to the GC here, which eked out again. I mean, it just barely. You look at the candle, it doesn't look that great. On the day, you had gold up 0.05%. It barely moved. It was 80 cents an ounce to the upside for gold on this 20, uh, just the February 2020 contract. 1,465. It's actually up another dollar in the after hour session right now. But that is your top seven markets. Hopefully, some of that put some green in your pockets as well today. All right. Uh, finally, got some activity out there. Dana, Carlos, Doris, Dave, and Jeffrey. Hello. Good to see you guys all on our All My Trading Academy YouTube page. And there we go. Robert. Hello, everybody. We got some new people in here. Music Man. Uh, get to see everyone, and happy all-time highs for you to unscamble. All right. Uh, let's see, I had a question that came in from Uman. I hope I pronounced your name right. U-M-A-N. I'm thinking it's Uman. Um, the question was, what are your thoughts on China issuing debt in U.S. dollars? It's nothing new, right? They, they can issue their debt in, in whatever currency they really want. And you know, the question has to be, why would they do that? Why would China be issuing debt in U.S. dollar denomination? And the key with debt is when you pay that debt back, you want to pay it back with as weak of a currency as possible. So my guess is China feels that they, there's two things here. Number one, I think that China feels that the U.S. dollar is going to take a dive, which mm, I wouldn't be so shocked to see that happen either. So if they lend out, let's say the, the most recent number that they're lending out um, for this most recent release was about $6 billion. And, and so far in 2019, they've already issued $195 billion worth of U.S. denominated debt. So down the road, and these maturities are three year, five year, 10 year, 20 years, when they have to pay back that balance in dollars to the person who uh, lent them the money, what they'll do is they will pay it back with US dollars, which at some, in theory, would be much weaker. Therefore, it costs them a lot less to buy back and pay back that loan. So it's a smart move. It's also a risky move because should the dollar really appreciate significantly over that period of time, then China would obviously take it in the shorts. So it's important that they are not important, I guess it's important if you're ever issuing debt that you want to try to uh, issue it in the currency that you think is going to be dropping so when you buy it back, you don't have to worry about all the, the gains. For China, though, there's another thing here. Obviously, it's a debt issue, and we've been trying to devalue our currency for a long time. Now, that, that will continue to happen. The other part here is it's the world reserve currency. Brenton Woods and all that really established the U.S. as the reserve currency for the world, and we do, we're do we such a major percentage of GDP. Now. Those tides have changed. Now, I asked, uh, I asked Simon to, to find an image for me, and I think you might have found the right one. Let's see if we can bring this one up here for our viewers out at home. Um, this just shows you the top 10 world's biggest economies for 2019 and 2020. Now, of course, the U.S. and a nominal GDP in U.S. trillions of dollars, the U.S. is still by far the top dog. But notice how quickly China is growing. In 2019, they were at 14.24% trillion dollars worth of GDP. They're expected to be in 2020 at 15.67. That's a gain of 1.43 trillion. Whereas the US was at 21.5, expected to be at 22.3. That's a gain of only 800 billion. Now, obviously we know that China has a potential for some explosive growth here, but what it shows is they are becoming more and more of a threat as the global GDP leader. 
Now, if that happens, what may shift may be that this US dollar, with, which for my entire lifetime, I have known as the reserve currency for the world, that may shift. And I think part of this is they're putting pressure on the US dollar and trying to make the yuan the reserve currency for the world. They're doing this uh, Belt and Road Initiative, which is really trying to unite all of uh, Europe and Asia in, in trade partnerships, which could further accelerate their dominance in that region with regards to GDP. That could not only accelerate their growth in GDP, but hurt our expansion with regards to GDP there. So, um, you know, we talk about a trade war. This is definitely one of those things that's escalating that. And I think that at some point we have to look at reality in the face and say, there is such an opportunity in, the, in China with regards to global growth that in the foreseeable future, it could actually be the reserve currency of the world. And I think that's part of the reason that China is issuing debt in US dollars, is to put pressure on the US dollar and also to put theirs in the forefront. So just my two cents, I'm sure I'm gonna get some uh, patriots out there that say that I'm crazy and I'm, I'm being anti-patriotic. No, it's just economics and just the way the world turns. There's always some power that steps up and takes over with regards to reserve currencies. The US wasn't always that reserve currency. So Uman, um, thank you for that question. It's a little bit different than what we normally tackle here on the show, but uh, happy to give you my insights. Not everybody has to agree with it, but I think we'll, uh, I, you look 10 years down the road, maybe 15 years down the road, we'll probably be singing a different story, but it's going to take some time for that reserve currency status to change. Okay, uh, let's take a quick break. Week we back, we'll have Rick Wright on the program. We're going to talk global currencies today. Why not? We already talked about biggest GDPs. We'll talk about trade wars. Why not? Let's just dive deeper into it. If you have a specific currency pair you would like us to look at, unless your name is Gaier and you want us to look at the South African Rand Japanese Yen cross pair, uh, send your questions in. Let us know what currencies you'd like us to analyze here on the show for you. You can send those in at powertradingradio.com by clicking that Power Blast button or Go to our YouTube channels. We've got a pretty active audience out there today. Send in your comments and questions out there and hopefully we'll get to all of them right after a short break. There are lots of different reasons why I teach. I know what it's like from the beginning because I was a student here. I love going around the classroom and you get those aha moments where, you know, slowly, slowly those light bulbs switch on as the week unfolds. And, and for me, it's magical. I've been telling students for years that I derive professional satisfaction from sharing my knowledge about trading. I grew up on the floor of the Board of Trade. My father was my first mentor. I like to see people run. And in order for them to run, they need to walk well first. And for me to help them build a solid foundation and then watch them go forward, that's something that money can't buy. What these people are now realizing is the freedom that they have always wanted to achieve. And it's a quite humbling and honorable experience to be able to know that in some small way I contributed to them. The students make the academy. And I always, I meet wonderful people from all walks of life and they always have a story to tell. And the story is always interesting. Being able to explain things in a way where the light bulb goes off and that gives me the chills. It's, it's a wonderful experience to see that growth in somebody else and, and that you're a part of that. That's a, it's magic. The students, I really want to enable them to bypass the challenges that everybody goes through. There is rather a, a selfish aspect and that selfish aspect is I have found more of me as a person. Just a self-discovery. And in every class that I teach, I get to share my knowledge and I get to see each and every one of my students learn how to trade in a bull market and in a bear market and even in a sideways market. And each time I see that, that student of mine take that first trade, it's such a rewarding experience. It's awesome. Welcome back to Power Trading Radio Live and your host, Merlin Rothfeld, with today's special guest. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Power Trading Radio. It is your Monday edition. You may be going, what on earth is this guy next to me doing? He shouldn't be here on a Monday. He should be here on a Tuesday, but I switched things up just to get some Forex exposure earlier on in the week. We have Rick Wright joining us. Rick, how are you doing? Doing fantastic, Merlin. Thanks for having me back. Appreciate it. Uh, always a pleasure. Uh, welcome to the Sunshine State. Mr. Snowbird. Uh, yeah, a little, uh, little extra snow Durango over the past uh, few days, but uh, it's looking good for the ski resort. So it is. Have it. Yeah, are you a skier? You no. Know? No, I don't do any of that uh, wintry mountain type stuff. It's too dangerous. So you move to the mountains, you move to the wintry place, but you don't want to do any wintry things. Uh, That's like me moving to California and say I don't surf. It's, I don't, I don't it's, surf, by the it's way. All, it's all dangerous. 
It's all dangerous. Stop it's, being it's, so old. It, it's just as much fun to sit there and have a, oh, have, I was a, have a drink and watch everybody <laughs> else tumble tumble down the mountains. Anyway. You know what? Uh, on that note, watching everybody else tumble down the mountains, uh, we are in the midst of a, of a global currency war. And I'm sure that we've had some... I wouldn't say interesting moves. It's been kind of boring lately, honestly, with regards to the mm -hmm. Forex space, volatility's dropped. Uh, any high-level thoughts on, on the markets that you want to address before we get going into questions? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's just getting slower and slower. If you look at the dollar index, it looks like it's forming a big, fat, slow, rounded top over the past uh, several quarters. So, yeah, it's, I don't know. It, Overall, looking weaker, but there's 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 really nothing uh, terribly committed as far as uh, that stuff goes. Sure looks right. like fun though. Yeah, well, looks like a mountain. <laughs> Says the guy from Colorado <laughs> who doesn't ski. Um, let's dive a little deeper into that. So this is obviously a pretty critical week for the U.S. Uh, there were th some of you were asking about the FOMC, what the Fed is going to do. Let me um, share something with you real quick. Simon had it up earlier. There it is. Uh, this is the CME. Fed funds futures rate uh, rating, uh, basically what they're expecting to have happen on the meeting on Wednesday. And right now it's a 99.3% chance they're going to stay right where we are at. So uh, that's what we're looking forward to. For those of you who are, are current, want to look a year out, um, it's definitely pretty clear that they're going to be talking about cutting rates with in 2020. Um, to varying levels, there's some expectations of it going all the way to 25 basis points, which I think would be absolutely crazy. Uh, but at least one or two cuts coming next year by this, by this time in 2020. But for right now, you're looking at no change happening on Wednesday's meeting. Now there are some other ones happening this week, which are probably going should be rather noteworthy. Um, let me see if I can pull the calendar up here so I can get exact. Uh, we we had a, the calendar all set up here for everybody, but then again, I had to go and change things. Leave it to me. Simon, to remove everything. Uh, let's see. So what do we got this week? We have, um, I know we got the U.S. on Wednesday. It, it, later in the week, aren't they? Yeah, U.S. is yep. Wednesday. Who else do we have? We have the Swiss National Bank at negative three, uh, three quarters of one percent. Uh, what's the third one? Was it Japanese yen? It wasn't, I forget. Uh, no, it was euro. Main, main refinance yep. rate, talking about <clears throat> in, in euro. Can say the same? Uh, as we come into a week where you got the U.S., you have the Swiss National Bank, and you have the Europe making rate announcements. How do you, how do you position yourself? Do you do anything different? Um, well, what I'm literally doing this week is zero foreign currency trades, because everybody's kind of waiting around. There's not a ton of movements, you know, for bigger time frame type of stuff that I prefer. So, you know, since you can't really moderate or manage your risk, you know, down to the nickel like I prefer to do when there's interest rate decisions. So you have those things going on with the, all three of those central banks. Plus, you have uh, some elections in Great Britain uh, that are also coming out this week. Plus, we have the potential tariffs uh, kicking in on Sunday. Sunday. Yep. I'm basically just sitting on my hands, watching everybody figure out what they're trying to do. Just going to enjoy the week out here in California where there's, there's mountains, but they're covered in smog. So. No, we got snow on them. I can't see it because of the smog. Oh, so get out of here. Not uh, <clears throat> so no FOMO. No fear of missing out on some great move that could happen. I mean, come on, when you have this type of event, or these types of events, especially the tariff stuff on Sunday night, mm -hmm. you know, this, this does open the door for, you know, 1,000 pip moves in short order. It does. It definitely does <laughs> open it up for that. And um, you know what? If it happens without me, it happens without me. There's, uh, there's always going to be new trades next week, next month. Um, I'll be fine because you know, going for a thousand pip move in a few hours or a day or two. You know what? Uh, what type of risk do you have to accept to uh, accept that type of reward? Three, three hundred, four hundred pips. Eh, I'm good. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's 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 just risky, <laughs> and you know it's tough to, to kind of sit on your hands, especially when you know there's potentially going to be some mm -hmm. very big moves out there. Um, I have two questions on. I'll start with the, the the higher level question here on the British pound. This comes from. Steve on Online Trading Academy's YouTube channel. He says, the future of the British pound after Brexit. Okay, well, we've been talking about this one for years <laughs> now, so um, why not? I, I don't recall. I think I asked you when it was first happening what you thought of it. Now you can dive even deeper into it. Give me your thoughts on what you think is going to happen uh, the British pound after Brexit. Um, well, I mean, the trend's been going up. They're uh, thinking it might actually maybe happen, and with the uh, Boris Johnson being, you know, back in charge where he's at, mm -hmm. his uh, super cool hairdo and all that stuff. You know, he's super cool hair. Hey, he's just taking <laughs> he's just taking stylistic advice from our leader. <laughs> I, I think they go to the same same the, the uh, same, same barber shop. <laughs> <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean it's, they've been going up for you know several weeks now. So, you know, I I think the uh, the, the danger of Brexit has uh, already been priced in. Now people are probably kind of sorta 
you know, thinking that maybe it's going to all be okay. Yeah, maybe. you know, um, for Steve who asked that question, it's it's such an open-ended question when you say the future of British pound after Brexit. We, we don't know what that will be. We don't know whether they're going to back back down and all of a sudden have a referendum vote and say, you know what, we made a mistake. Let's just all go back to being <laughs> friends and we want to be in the euro again. Or there is actually a Brexit. And then it says, well, how does that... How does that transpire? Is it an aggressive, hostile thing where the EU is basically going, well, you know what? We're putting sanctions on you and tariffs and we're going to have trade border issues and all your tourists that come over, they have to go through loops and everything. Or is it going to be, okay, you've left, we have an agreement, everything's structured and there's mm -hmm. no uncertainty. So those are three possibilities that either one of those choices could have a profound impact on the British pound. I think, and I, and I don't think it's going to be something that we can make a clear definitive decision in like a month or two months. I think that if you were to look years after, so let's say they have an exit, whether it's going, or Brexit, whether it's going to be a hostile one or amicable and they agree on the terms, I think in the long run, it's going to be very good for the British pound mm -hmm. in the long run. I think you have to look at that as a long-term play. In the short term though, Boy, I tell you, that's, that's a crapshoot. It's anybody's guess. You've seen some great volatility. I agree with Rick right now. You look at this chart here, which Simon will bring it up for you. Um, the British pound is looking a lot better. You know, it's certainly not back to where we saw it back in 2016, right? You could look back here. That's when the Brexit happened. You know, we're up at 150. Well, we haven't been anywhere close to that uh, for quite some time. We did spike up at 2018 a little bit. Right now, you're starting to look better. It's looking healthy. It feels like there's some optimism in the British pound, maybe some bottom feeders out there. But from a pure technical perspective, this looks pretty good. No, I, I think there's a ton of room left in this thing to the upside. Now, I, I wouldn't be buying it today. I mean, obviously, with the, uh, the elections coming out in just a couple of days, parliament elections, and you know, how far we've gone, how fast we've gone, you know, running into all that supply dating back for you know, months and months. Give me a decent little pullback, and uh, you know, I'll be happy to be a buyer of pretty much anything with the pound in it. Uh, nice. Not this second. Yep. Uh, it's funny. Unscammel says, what would, what would a Germany exit be called? An apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> I seriously, if you have the, imagine like any, any, any team. I, I guess you could take the New England Patriots, who I am absolutely, I hate the Patriots with a passion. I was so glad to watch them lose miserably last night in football. Um, sorry. But if all sorry, of a sudden, Seamus. in his prime, yeah, sorry, Seamus, not sorry. <laughs> if you look at Tom Brady in his prime, right? Mm -hmm. And if all of a sudden he was done and out, even though you've got great coaching, you've got great players, that team would probably suffer significantly because of that leadership. Germany is the Tom Brady of the European Union. Germany is the Lamar Jackson of the Ravens for the European Union. And to lose that one individual, that one country, which is carrying the, the fulcrum of it all, if they were to leave, it would be one hell of an ugly mess for the European Union. I, I could see some significant, I mean, honestly, as someone who trades Forex, I think it would be great because there would be crazy <laughs> moves on a regular basis. Uh, it would be something that would be drawn out for quite some time. Mm -hmm. But there have been grumblings about Germany not being happy and wanting to, to leave. Well, I mean, mathematically, the euro shouldn't exist anyway. I mean, it, it almost disappeared, what was it, eight, nine years or so back. Um, but yeah, there'd be most of those uh, countries who are borrowing at the same rate that uh, Germany is interest rate loan-wise. Um, they don't. They don't deserve it. They don't have the proper credit rating. If you really you know, do the math. So yeah, if they left, you know, I would imagine that the euro is going to go out of business. I would. I imagine. thought it was ten years ago, but <laughs> uh, you know, what do I know? But if they left, yeah, definitely. That's that thing's gone. Yeah, Ireland, Greece, Italy. I'll be like, hey, <laughs> what about us? We got nothing over here. Um, it would. It would. The, the the experiment would fail. But I don't think Germany will leave. I think that it's, it's too big, too much global pressure, too much money on it. Honestly, for them yeah. to, to back out of it. Um, all right, Rick Wright is our guest today. We're talking global currency. I had one question from Heath, which uh, we'll get to after the break, and that has to do with that British pound chart that we just looked at, although that seems to be a shorter term trade. He says, I shorted it on Sunday at 131.65. We'll look at that when we come back after a quick break. If you have anything you would like us to look at today, send it on in at powertradingradio.com, or if you're on our YouTube channels over there at Power Trading Radio or Online Trading Academy, just type it in the chat. We'll bring it up on our next segment. We'll be right back after a short break. Learning this way is fine when the stakes are low. But when the stakes are high, you need to rely on skill, not just knowledge. At Online Trading Academy, you build your skill one step at a time. We teach our students to trade and invest with a strategy, not a hunch. You learn our methodology, then practice it. You get to make mistakes and ask questions, and watch instructors make live trades. Develop your skill the right way. Click here to get started with Online Trading Academy. Meet Mac. 
As a trader, he liked the signals that came from technical analysis tools, but they didn't help him find the best trades consistently, so he searched for a new approach. Mac attended online trading academies free class and discovered their core strategy, a trading methodology that spots when big banks are likely buying and selling, so everyday investors can too. Mac carved out a path to trade and invest with confidence, and so can you. You've been listening to Power Trading Radio, live, fueled by Online Trading Academy. To learn more, visit us online at powertradingradio.com. Welcome back to Power Trading Radio, everyone. It is your Monday edition. We're calling it Forex Monday out there today. We have Rick Wright joining us here in studio. We're, we're talking in the previous segment about uh, the British pound. We're talking about Brexit. Of course, that was spurred by a bunch of listener comments and questions. So thank you for those. Keep them coming in. If you have a different currency pair you want us to analyze, let us know what it is. Uh, I will... Draw some lines on the chart here, Rick. This is a question that came in from uh, Heath. He says, and this isn't, I'm going to just shut up because he says he wants to hear your thoughts on the British pound. So I'm done. Thank you. Um, would love to hear Rick's thoughts on the British pound. I shorted Sunday night at 131.65. So let me have Simon draw that line. Well, close enough for government work, Simon. You can, that's good enough. Um, all right. We've got a lot of lines going on there, but nice one, Heath. Oh, I'm not supposed to talk. This is supposed to be you. So he shorted it uh, Sunday night, so basically last night. Okay. What are your thoughts on it? Uh, well, it comes down to uh, how long was this trade supposed to be for? Is it supposed to be for uh, 15, 20 minutes trying to squeeze out, you know, a dozen pips? Or are you trying to do this thing for, uh, you know, two or three, four weeks trying to squeeze out a couple of hundred? If it's a very short term, congratulations. Good job. Glad you made money. I'm glad you're out. If it's a longer term trade, I'm not a tremendous fan of... Uh, basically going against the type of trend that this thing has been in for the past uh, few months. Mm -hmm. um, you know, pretty much everything about all the candles and stuff from the last few months is telling you that this thing wants to go higher. So again, short term, good job. You know, you made, made, made a few bucks. Uh, longer term, I, I would use any of these uh, supply levels. Uh, the pullbacks from some of these supply levels is, you know, maybe a chance to uh, look for a long trade on this thing. Again, other than because of the elections, uh, I, I would avoid it till that's done. Yeah, you know, and I agree with Rick. I think, uh, you know, you, I, I actually like the short trade. I do. Um, but you have to look one glaringly obvious thing in the face. You are going against the grain. You're going against the trend. And you're shorting an impulse move that's very, very fast after a breakout. Now, some people would call this a bullish flag pattern. That's actually what we had drawn on here. You guys can see these little lines. This was a bullish flag pattern. And you notice when it ripped, it retested and then just soared. It, to me, it actually has more legs to move to the upside. So I'd be pretty nervous if I were you for a couple different reasons. Number one, well, you shorted at the supply level from back here on the 2nd of May, which great, that, that was nice. That's probably why you made this trade. But look at the price action right now. What has it done over the past four days, right? It smacked its head against that line right where you got in. Um, you have this, this really a shooting star pattern right here. It didn't follow through though. This candle where Simon has his cursor on right now, to me is a, a very bearish sign. And if I was in that trade when you were in it, I'd be licking my lips going, yeah, baby, here we go. But there was no follow through today to the downside. This makes me nervous that that little hesitation, normally you'd get a bigger pullback, right? After an impulse move like this, but you didn't get it. So I would move my, my stop loss down a little bit and lock in a little bit of profit here because this has the, t uh, the possibility to rip up. Now, if we get down below these lows right here at around what, 131, 31, and it breaks the low of that shooting star, okay. Now I think you have uh, the opportunity for some more downside movement, but it's dangerous because you're, you're fighting the trend. You're going against the current on, on, a, on a pair that has a lot of positive things going for it right now. Mm -hmm. yeah, looking at that, it looks right, right about the, uh, the 130 mark. There's a, a little bit of uh, demand in there at a smaller time frame. You know, plus the big round numbers, folks love to focus on the big round numbers. So about 130 would, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, maybe a potentially uh, optimistic target on the short side. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, this thing has, there's so much room to the upside on that. You know, if it came down to 130, I'd probably be looking at, uh, you know, flipping from a short to a long or just go along if you weren't already short on that. Good luck. Yeah, that's a tough one. You know, there's a question came in from uh, Marita. Thank you, Marita. I hope I pronounced it the name correctly says, what does it mean when price is sitting mostly in weekly and daily supplies on that British pound USD? Um, you guys can see right now that we've been obviously looking at the daily here and we can, we can bump this up to weekly if you like, just to see the different perspective. But here's your weekly of the British pound. 
Um, right now, and take my lines off because this is just gonna. I'm gonna move it. Just move it out of the way. Um, you know, you could argue. Yeah, we're a daily. We're a weekly. But does it mean anything? Is there a significance to that for you? Well, I I, I might buy it. Yeah, I might be in the minority. Um, my I, I put more weight on the trend mm -hmm. than into uh, uh, supply and demand zones because you know in an uptrend supply breaks and a downtrend demand yeah. breaks and you, know, you look at the last week's candle that is a big solid green week yeah. going right into supply Hell I agree week. with you on that but you know like I said um, in an uptrend supply tends to break until it doesn't yeah and we've got what, what do we have one two three four four about six weeks six weeks of consolidation. Um, I think we have another week or two to the upside. Yeah, I do. Again, you know, outside of the election, our elections, um, there's, there should have a more continuation to the upside. You know, and looking at that chart, I think it's pretty clear and obvious that when you, when you stare at it, you know, we can move this line up here. Move, put another one on there, Simon. You know, you have some area right back in here, which maybe can go a little bit higher. It's right around that 132, 132.90 mark up to right around, you know, 133.83. After that, there's really not a lot of strong supply at all. So this this could have the potential to move rather quickly once it breaks through some of these. So again, I, I'm I'm more bullish on the British pound than I am bearish. I think there are some opportunities for the short term from a short perspective, like uh, Heath is in right now. You just got to be careful. You know, when you're going against a trend like this, you you can blow your account real quick, especially with the leverage that forex offers you. Yeah. Uh, do you trade the Brazilian real? I do not. Okay. I do not Because there was interesting. I got a question that came through from a viewer out there, and it says, uh, let's see. Uh, Patrick says, any interest in the Brazilian uh, to go long on, your, on my watch list? No. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, it's, Next. it's weird. No, no, it's nothing. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it. I think you actually, uh, I don't even know if I get that one. There's your Brazilian real U.S. dollar chart. Um, look, I mean, look at, the, look at the picture of this thing. This is absolutely horrible. This is weekly. Now, you could make the argument that it's basing. I would make the argument that this looks like a descending triangle and it wants to break lower. There is a lot of talk and positive stuff about Brazil right now, especially with agricultural exports because of the trade war in the U.S. Uh, China is now doing a lot more business with Brazil and that may actually strengthen their economy and thus the currency. To me, that's a long shot. Um, I still would feel rather nervous trading the Brazilian real from the long-term perspective like that. I, they've got a lot of political uncertainty. Take a look what's happened over the past week or two. Yeah, it looks pretty darn good, but just in this picture alone, on this daily, what do we see? Lower highs, lower lows. There's a phrase that we all love to use in our classes, every instructor when we teach, which is the trend is your friend until the bend at the end. And I don't believe that that last two weeks of activity here on the real US dollar uh, is any indication that the trend is broken. I still think you're on a downtrend. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, we're basically just banged up what, all-time lows? Yeah, or at least, a, a at least from what I, what I can get. Yeah, I'll go back to the weekly. Um, I'll go monthly just so we can see the longer term picture. Yeah, I mean, we're historic lows against the US dollars. <coughs> and that hasn't been this low since, actually it was back down here in 2015, uh, but we are pretty much at historic lows. Well, if if you're still above those lows in 2015, you know, I don't I don't really mind being a little bit of a bottom fisher on something like that because when you have that type of reward to risk ratio, it kind of makes it makes sense. I'd still give it, you know, probably another day or not another day, uh, <laughs> another week or two. Um, let some of this trade war tariff stuff uh, shake out, and if we're still above that low from uh, way back then, you know, give it a small shot and. Uh, you know, why not add to it if it uh, decides to keep going? Because it's got a lot of room uh, that that thing can go. Yeah. Now, my only problem, or my main problem, I guess, with some of these um, you know, exotics, if you will, is you know it, now you have to do a little bit of extra work, and I'm inherently lazy. Because now if you're going to do something, I love self-admitted laziness. That's great. <laughs> in the mountains, and I'm lazy. So it's one of those. <laughs> You know, now you have to actually do a little bit of research to find out when Brazil's central bank is going to have interest rate decisions. You know, what are some of their economic events you have to be aware of? And if you're going to be in a trade for 15 minutes, it doesn't matter. But if right. you're going to be in this trade for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, maybe even a couple of quarters, you got to start doing a lot more research on the things that move this particular market. Mm -hmm. Central banks at the very, very minimum. One rule I uh, teach in class is if that central bank schedule is not on forexfactory.com, um, then you got to do a lot of extra work to figure out what 
yeah. you know, when their when their stuff is coming out. So. Yeah, and usually, you know, when you go to a lot of these forex sites, they'll give you a lot of economic data for the majors. You know, you're talking mm -hmm. uh, the British pound, the Canadian dollar, Japanese yen, Australia, even Chinese markets, which I don't yeah. trade anything with the China market uh, currency wise. Um, but that type of information is readily available. Anything like this, where you start to get into, you know, the Brazilian real, or or one of our viewers likes to look at the um, uh, what's the one that he liked the, the South African rand. You know, you're going to have to dig for that information. It makes mm -hmm. it a little bit more challenging. Not that you can't do it, but that there's inherently more risk there because you are trading a, th a more thinly traded market. Right. Um, gentleman was asking, what are the spreads on this one? I don't know. Right now, it's this this account here is not connected to a broker, so it's not uh, showing the actual spread. But my assumption would be, it's rather wide because this is not a uh, one of the more popular traded instruments. Yeah, like many of the exotics, uh, it's a little bit wider. The moves can be extra violent. <laughs> um, extra violent. Extra. Not normal violence, but extra. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you know, be careful on that. Like I said, another couple of weeks when some of this tariff stuff uh, from the weekend is uh, shaking out priced in. Monday morning Hopefully. will be fun. Oh, it's going to be a good day. Uh, Rick, you're in Irvine, California. This week, I'm assuming that next week you aren't going to be teaching because it's the holiday weeks. Where are you, gonna, where are you headed to next to teach? Uh, about the only thing I've got on my... Uh, um, Wintertime schedule right now. I got a forex class in Houston, Texas next month. But being uh, living in the mountains and the travel that goes along with it, you usually don't do much uh, January, February. So nice. right now, that's all I got. All right, Houston it is. If you want to buy him a, a shot down there, because you, you probably need it after the, <laughs> the frozen tundra that is Colorado. He'll be teaching a forest class in Houston. To find out more information on that class, you can click that link. It's going to show up in social media right now. If you click on that one, you type in your zip code. It'll tell you which of our 48 physical brick and mortar schools are nearest to you. There's free classes, paid classes, community events. Rick will be at the Houston one coming up here soon. But of course, there are a lot of other great Forex traders that we have uh, teaching for Online Trading Academy. They're all there to help you understand how these markets work, figure out how to put them to your advantage. So if you want to learn more, click that link and find out more information. Rick, thanks so much. Appreciate it coming on. Thanks for having me, Merlin. Guys, we're going to take a quick break. We come back. Economic calendar, earnings announcements, and our guest for tomorrow. We'll be right back after a short break. It's just very gratifying and um, the, the benefits of, of uh, traveling and getting to share my knowledge and, and really seeing a student you know, on Saturday morning, a little trepidation, a little nervousness, and then by Thursday and Friday, they're just following the process, clicking buttons, trading, first at sim, then live, you know, and it's just uh, tremendously gratifying. So I'm looking forward to the next 10 years. Trading can be a lonely career, right? Especially if you're just sitting in your basement by yourself, typing away on a keyboard. So I needed an outlet and I'm able to come and connect and, and share what, you know, what I've really enjoyed and it's helped me and so th th there's part of that's the giving back and I really enjoy that and if you know if I can make a difference in somebody's life that's that's a pretty awesome thing. Seeing students start out well I'm not sure I'm not quite sure I'm nervous and to be able to give them the confidence throughout the week where they feel that they finally can do what they want to do and that they know that I'm there that that online trading academy is there for them to hold their hand, help them out anytime they want to be, to me that's the best possible thing you can do. For me, I wanted a way to be able to give back. You know, naturally I, I've learned something at such a young age that uh, this is a skill that I can use for my entire life. So being able to give back to other students who are going through that same journey, uh, that's something that to me means a lot and that I, I, it's a, a pleasure to be able to do every day. This is Power Trading Radio, live. Real people, real money, real trades. Visit us online at powertradingradio.com. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Power Trading Radio. It is your Monday edition. Thank you all for joining us today and all the great comments. You guys are pretty active out there, especially on the uh, Power Trading Radio YouTube channel. You guys are having all kinds of fun. Uh, let's see. Rick mentioned he'll be teaching in Houston, Texas. Yes, I, I, unfortunately I've never seen the new, I haven't been to the new center. I was there at the old one. I actually really like the old center and apparently the new one is an amazing upgrade. So uh, if you guys are in the Houston area, I'd encourage you to check that one out. He'll be teaching a Forex class there. You can find out more information on that class by clicking that link that's showing up in social media right now. Or if you are on your treadmill at the gym right now, have a great workout. But when you're done, or if you can manage to text and, and look at your phone, go to powertrainingradio.com and in the upper right hand corner you see a little button that says free class. 
Simply click on that one, type in your zip code, and it also will tell you which center is closest to you, and hopefully it'll be the Houston class. If not, hey, you got 47 other centers to choose from. And even online classes, self-paced content, whatever you like. All right, uh, let's see. I had a question that came through right at the end there from Tate. Tate says, uh, in addition to supply and demand, what are your thoughts on using commitment of traders or the COT reports to help identify trading opportunities? Love it. I think it's an incredibly powerful tool if used properly, right? It's not really a day trading vehicle. It's not meant to be for shorter term traders, but if you're looking for seasonality, pattern swings, and understanding what the producers, the institutions, commercials are all doing, it's a very, very powerful tool. Now, I wouldn't, I don't think it's beneficial from a Forex perspective, but from a commodity perspective, uh, I think it's very powerful. You can find out more information looking at the lessons from the pros. Don Dawson did some great articles, which are free to everybody out there on commitment of traders and what are some of the impacts and how it works. Uh, he's also been on this program. Next time he's on, we'll talk about commitment of traders. I think it's a very powerful tool uh, in conjunction with supply and demand. You know, there's a, a great aspect of seasonality to some to these commodities that a lot of us don't really pay attention to. So I think it's a great one. So great question, Tate. All right, Simon, bring up our economic counter for tomorrow. We had nothing happen for the U.S. today, and tomorrow we start to enter a little bit into the fray. We have revised non-farm productivity and revised unit labor costs. And while those aren't great announcements, it's something on the board for the U.S. Of course, our big heavy hitters will be on Wednesday. For the euro, you're looking at German ZEW economic sentiment. For the British pound, you have the NIESR GDP estimate. And for Australia, you have Westpac consumer sentiment. All right, let's go to your economic calendar. Earnings calendar, excuse me. AutoZone, Ashted. I'm hoping I pronounced that one right. That could make a lot of mistakes there. Uh, HD Supply Holdings, all these bargain outlets, Pivotal Software, Can't Tell Medical, Designer Brands, and Dave and & Busters. Most of these, you probably have no clue what they do. I, I mean, come on, most of these aren't companies we would probably want to hold in our portfolio, but they are coming out with earnings tomorrow, so be careful. These are just a small sampling of them. There are many more reporting earnings tomorrow. Make sure you check your economic calendar and earnings calendar so that you don't get caught off guard. All right, guests for tomorrow, pretty excited to have them on. It's a little bit, uh, we've shifted everything one day, apparently. We're going to have Michael Young. Michael Young will be on the program. He's a longtime floor trader from out in Chicago, just one of the more down-to-earth, chill people you'll ever meet. We'll talk about the markets and see what his perspectives are. Of course, I always love having your input, your guys' questions today help steer our show, and I appreciate that. What I would recommend is that you send those questions in sooner rather than later. Uh, obviously, I love doing them live, but I think it looks weird. I'm always staring over here, reading your questions and the narratives and all that stuff uh, to, to incorporate them into the show. If you have something that would require a lot of research, maybe not a lot, I don't have too much time uh, to prep for this show, I'll do the best I can. You can send it in at powertradingradio.com by clicking that Power Blast button. Let me know what you want us to cover. Tomorrow we'll probably be on the futures side of things, maybe options as well, because Michael traded in the CBOE as well. But let us know what you'd like us to cover on the program. You can send those on in at powertradingradio.com by clicking Power Blast. Of course, click that link showing up at social media to find out more about how we can educate you and how these markets truly work. Until then, happy trading, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Take care.